Okay, take two. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Have a look. Just waiting for Robin. Here we are, I think. Here we are. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, very well, thanks, mate. How are you? Good stuff. Yeah, really, really well, thank you. We got there in the end. (laughs) Yes. Nothing like having a little technology hiccup beforehand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so thank you for your time today. Um, That's a pleasure. Getting on live in the group. And um, I just want to introduce kind of all the mentors to the group and um, show your amazing stuff. So first of all, do you want to explain to the group who you are and um, how you got into business? Cool. Okay. So um, I'm Robin Waite, obviously. Um, I'm a business coach now, but I've got some uh, 17 years worth of a history in, in business now. So... Um, I'll, I'll kind of go right back to the start, if that's okay, just to get yeah, yeah, yeah. the full picture. So um, at the age of 18, basically, I started working for a medical devices company, um, so selling electrosurgical equipment. Um, but my job was as a systems analyst. So I was quite geeky, quite nerdy, so into databases and systems and things like that. Um, when I first started that working in that company, I think there was about 15 members of staff and we we're turning over about 800k. So kind of medium sized business, really. Um, and then about four years later, um, we'd grown the business. I say we, it was predominantly me, actually, because um, we'd grown the turnover to about one and a half million. Um, mm-hmm. I was pretty much at that point working underneath the MD of the business, um, you know, as a kind of fairly green 22 year old. Um, but actually six people have been made redundant because of the systems I'd put in place. Um, so, yeah, naively didn't realise the impact which I was having really on, on other people's lives. Um, yeah. And so when I did finally work it out, that uh, I, I realised that I wanted to do the opposite and that was to help people, you know, uh, get gainful employment rather than making people sort of unemployed. So um, I set up a creative agency, this is back in 2004, Did that for um, more than a decade, so I think it's about 12 years. Um, It's still kind of bobbing along in the the background, and I've actually recently found an acquirer for it. Um, So that that agency was really all about um, web design, branding, and that side of things. And for quite a long period of time, it was um, we were just just kind of doing the standard sort of service based business that every other web design agency was was doing, and we Mm -hmm. didn't look that much different. We were just another another creative agency but yeah. i realized that there's this thing called like design agency ping pong goes back and forth um so it starts you get a brief then you give the the, the client a quote and then they quibble the quote and then eventually start the work and then you send them a logo and then they say oh, well i like the font in that one and the colors from that one and this ping pong goes back and forth it lasts typically about two or three months um wow client gets frustrated we used to get frustrated in like billable time it was only about I don't know, um, 10 hours worth of billable time at the end of it at 50, Mm. 60 quid an hour. And I thought there has to be, this is my systems hat back on now, there has to be a better way. Mm. So I worked out that there are actually seven steps in our process and then thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this in a day? And so we did. We created a one-day branding workshop. Um, We also had a two-day website workshop. And ultimately we ended up charging about three times the price that we were charging so we would charge about 1500 quid for the day mm-hmm. whereas we were only getting about 600 pounds when we were doing this pink game of ping pong right. um we got the client into the workshop so it's really great so basically what what i didn't realize at that point was and what i'd stumbled across was this whole notion of productizing a service so working out what the, the, the system was the process how to then packaging up using my branding background and um and then kind of about a year or so ago, just before my, my second daughter was, was born, um, I just had a moment of like clarity and it was, uh, well, actually Daniel Priestley's books on the shelf behind me. So yeah, I, I, spotted that. I, I did one of Daniel's courses and I, um, I, it, I found it incredibly inspiring and realized that I had a lot more to offer than just building websites. And, mm-hmm. um, I wasn't getting the opportunity to really explore 
sort of helping business owners to develop their businesses on a much broader scale. So uh, basically, just before Sophie arrived, I had a little mini um, sort of, well, it's just a major moment of clarity, but a mini kind of midlife crisis. <laughs> Closed my agency down, um, enjoyed a month's worth of paternity leave and designed my coaching program and things like that in the meantime. Basically, just relaunched myself as a business coach. And what that did is it just gave me the opportunity then to start working with individual business owners, but on their whole business, not just one little little part of it. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And I'm right saying that your father was a police officer for Essex Police? He was, yeah, long time ago, mostly before I was born. So he was, he was, um, he joined when he was 18. So that would have been about uh, sort of through the late 1960s, early 70s. So pre pre days of radios. <laughs> so I remember him telling me stories where they used to have to go and check in every two hours at the local phone box. So phone into the station just to let them wow. know that they're okay. And um, silly things like, he, you know, the way he used to describe it, and I'm sure Dagenham and South then probably aren't quite like this, uh, <laughs> but it used to sound a little bit like the Wild West, you know, and there were fights in pubs and the windows and doors were bulging and he used yeah. to go in charging in there with him and his, his, um, hit the other guys that he worked with and you know there were bodies kind of th being thrown out of the doors and windows and things like that and it was a, it was a bit well not a bit but it was very different to policing as it stands today yeah uh, i remember having a conversation with him as well when i was um I, I think it was kind of when i was just about to step into the job as the systems analyst like you know wouldn't it be cool because my grandfather was also a police officer so my dad was a police oh, officer. Wow. I thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if i was a police officer too? <laughs> yeah. dad, dad just went don't he said it's totally changed he said these great stories i used to tell you um you know it it's I, and this is where i got a huge hat tip to every person in services because it's more dangerous you know there's so much more risk associated with it and i, I people are people are just so much more on edge generally i think these days and mm -hmm. um and it, he said you know it, it was good advice to him um you know actually your skills are in business like why don't you explore that and i did <clears throat> Amazing, amazing. And with regards to, um, so you're, for those who don't know, you're the Shift to Success products mentor. What's about products that you love? Is it the designing? Is it actual the value? What is it about products you love about creating? So it's, uh, I think there's a number of different things. First one is the clarity. So you, you have to, in order to productize something, you've got to be really specific about what that product looks like. You wouldn't go into a BMW showroom and where somebody's designed a, a new BMW like M3, and they go, well, we weren't kind of sure whether we should do three wheels or four. So we've kind of done it with four and we hope that they don't fall off. You wouldn't, you, you would, you need to know that when you buy that BMW that all of the wheels are on there and it's going to work for, at least, you know, if it's a new one, at least, you know, three or five years under the service and warranty. So mm -hmm. it's a similar sort of principles to, um, to turning a service into a product. So I work predominantly with service-based businesses, but yeah. for turning a service into a product, it's like having that really clear clearly defined sort of process step-by-step -step process that you take clients through and secondly what the outcome is so a product is like a, it's almost like a trans transformation type it's, it's you take client especially in a service-based business you take people on a journey a, tra a journey of transformation from a to b um and I suppose that's where it slightly differs from traditional products like cars, because you go in and buy a car and you get this wonderful feeling about, oh, I've just bought this great car. You know, it's well-deserved. There's a period of time that you've been thinking about which one you're going to buy and things like that. I suppose there's quite an element of that with products. But um, the beauty of it is, is when you've got that level of clarity around your own products, your clients get more, more clarity. Mm. And typically what I tend to see is people can then charge more as a result of it, because the experience is just better for everybody. Great. Amazing. And why is it important to have a niche, Rob? A niche? Um, yeah. Well, I suppose there are some, you know, I, I suppose there's a general, I could be a generalist business coach and help everybody, but actually it just mm. makes it easier for people to find you. So yeah. if you become well known for being a coach for professional service agencies, like I am, <laughs> so, you know, typically lawyers, accountants, IFAs and other agencies, what mm. I've tended to find then is, um, uh, a, those services find you really easily, but then people go, well, if you can do it for them, you can probably do it for us. So um, niche, niching, you know, otherwise what we're doing is when we're marketing and we, if we're, we serve everybody, we just kind of cast the net out, cross our fingers and hope that, you know, um, we'll get some customers out of it. 
Whereas if we go approach a, um, a law firm and say, well, look, I'm the best business coach for, um, for law firms in the Southwest, they're going to be picking up on, well, he said law firm. Well, that's me. Um, mm. We're looking for the best coach, you know, so it kind of starts speaking their language. Amazing. I mean, I completely agree. Um, and also like what you touched on a, mean, uh, a minute second ago was that once you actually get results in one market, you can actually go to others. Yeah. Yeah. So and they you, recognize you, that. That's it. Validate the idea in, in one marketplace, prove that you're an expert in that field, and then you can potentially move on to other, other market sectors if you need to. Um, because again, I mean, there's what, uh, if we were talking business to business, there's 3.9 million small businesses now in the UK. Mm. Like there aren't any new ideas out there and, um, there are going to be other people doing what you do. Um, mm -hmm. and we're going to, I think we're going to come on to USPs in a minute and we'll, yeah. so we'll chat about that, but some um, unique selling propositions, but, but there's no new idea. There's plenty of competition, plenty of other people doing what you, you're doing. Me as a bit small business owner, I don't need 3.9 million customers. I probably need 20, 40, yeah, yeah. maybe a couple of hundred to make mm -hmm. a, to create a really vibrant business. Mm -hmm. And so what a niche does is it just means you, you can, you've got a laser focus on exactly what product you're selling and what the guaranteed outcome is. If every single one of your clients is different, you've got to kind of almost create a slightly different outcome and a slightly different product for each one of them because every business is different, let's face it. But if they're all in the same sort of space, well, the product should be much more standardized. Great stuff, great stuff. And in regards to a, um, a product ecosystem, can you talk more about that and why a product alone is not enough in today's day and age? Okay, so uh, let's, think of a, let's think of some good examples here. So, um, I mean, again, I'm thinking kind of like um, Tesla, okay? So yep. again, so it's Daniel Priestley talks about quite a lot. So Tesla. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, imagine if the only thing that you could buy was a Tesla Model 3. That was it. There was no showroom. There were no baby groves or umbrella, umbrellas. There was no test drive. There was, there was nothing else. There was no brochure. There were no videos. There was, they didn't have any other assets. Um, it's a big ask to go to somebody and say, I've got this fantastic thing. It's called an electric car. It's a Tesla. Um, can you give me $36,000, please? Like most people are just like, what? <laughs> yeah. So the whole idea about product ecosystem is that you, you build a number of different assets basically to um, engage people um, and to build their trust and educate them about why, why um, A, an electric car is better than a normal, you know, a petrol or a diesel engine car, for example. <laughs> why then this Tesla is better than any other electric or hybrid vehicle um you know and then you can it, it's just a way of basically building trust so um if you take like a typical product ladder and we'll stick with tesla for example you can walk into their showroom so you may have seen an advert actually first of all yeah maybe then you check out their website and these are all products don't buy them they're free but they're all yeah. products then maybe you download their brochure or try out their if they've got like a most car car manufacturers have this like a little designer app so you can design your own car yeah, yeah. So we've hit already like four or five different touch points. You've probably been engaged now with the brand for maybe 20 or 30 minutes. Like if you're like me, I obsess so I want to get a Range Rover, so I'm going to get a Range Rover. And yeah. I, I haven't bought it yet because I'm obsessing over like what wheels I'm going to get, what, you know, what, yeah. whether I'm going to get smoked windows or not and all these things. <laughs> yeah. <of crazy>. so, <laughs> Like, and, and I can't make up my mind. So I'm just going to wait until I know exactly what I want. So, so now already I've spent, you know, countless hours engaged with Range Rover before I've even made my buying decision before, like I walk into the showroom and say, right guys, I'm ready to, here's my bag of cash. I'm going to, I'm going to buy this thing now. Mm -hmm. Then we walk into the showroom and they've got all of these other little things dotted around. Um, and so, and again, I know Daniel tells this story, but um, I, I, in Westfield before they even had a car, um in tesla showroom they had things like um golf umbrellas and baby grows yeah so the guy would walk over to the golfing bits like little bits and pieces and so yeah. the salesman walks up to the golf pro and uh, sorry the, this guy and says um i see you're looking at the do you play golf oh you do okay well the, the tesla you know it's got a boot which you can fit three sets of golf clubs in and your caddy and everything else and um you know oh by the way did i tell you it goes naught to 60 in 3.2 seconds so your mates will love that and starts mm -hmm. talking about all that side of it so his wife walks over to the checkout with a baby grow salesman spots that and goes over to him and says oh i see you pregnant she goes yeah so oh, did you know that we've got isofix bases in the back of the car you know Smart. the, the safety it's got the highest safety standard blah 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 so 
so we use the product ecosystem, the extra products, to basically um, get people to start giving us buying signals. And then Amazing. we can just talk their language. And, Amazing. and that's kind of it. The, and then the next step on, so sticking with the car manufacturing side of things, would be something like, so the car is the core product. And then you have like the, the kind of the service and maintenance package, which comes after that. And that's then what creates them their recurring revenue on a regular basis. Um, and that, for me, I, I focus a lot with my clients on creating that recur that steady recurring revenue, the direct debits which drop into your bank account on the first of every month, because that's like the um, my model is a product architecture, and it's like the foundations of the the business. If you know that your if your lights on figure, for example, is two grand a month, that pays the mortgage, it pays for the kids' university fees, puts food on the table, pays all the bills. Well, we want at least two grand dropping into our bank account by direct debit into our business on the first of every month. Yeah. Um, but you've got to have everything that comes before it and that core product, that product package, and then that service and maintenance package at the end of it. So that's the whole kind of product architecture. No, amazing, amazing stuff. And with regards to a value proposition, can you explain to the group what a value proposition is and why it's important for business success and explain that to your customers? Cool. Okay. So um, value, value proposition basically is um, it, it's what, what people buy. Okay. And I know that sounds a bit <laughs> profound, but so let me try and explain that. So imagine, um, okay, we'll do a bit of market research, right? So imagine this, Alex, I've got a, um, this really great product. Mm -hmm. um, what it does is when I'm cleaning my teeth, it's like the mirrors, which they use in the dentist surgery, but I can have, have it at home. And, um, uh, it helps me to clean my teeth better than if I was just brushing them with a toothbrush. So would you be interested in something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's step one of market research There's three steps. So second step is now how much would you pay for it? So I'm going to do a Dutch auction. Okay. So I'm going to okay. start low and work my way up. And when I hit your kind of limit with, the, okay. with this sort of base information I've given you, okay. it's a bit of a game. Um, you've got to tell me how much you pay for it. So five pounds. Yeah. And 10 pounds. Yeah. 20 pounds? Yep. 30? I feel we're getting to the edge. Yeah, pushing it, pushing it a little bit. 40? Yeah, yeah that's probably the max, yeah. So 40 max, okay. Mm -hmm. So we've identified that, okay, people like the idea. The second thing is we've identified there's now a need for it because you would actually partner some hard-earned cash to pay for my, my product. So the final thing is, and this is where the value proposition comes into it, I'm going to give you a story. Okay. okay. Alongside my sales pitch. Okay. So this time, here's my, here's my product. It's this thing that helps you clean your teeth a little bit better than if you were just brushing your teeth. Um, it's a bit similar to the mirrors, which I've got in a dentist. Now, if you don't buy this product, one of your teeth is going to fall out in the next 30 days. <laughs> my, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to pay a okay. lot, lot more straight away. There you go. So the value proposition sits in the story, the value of the product. Once you know exactly like, the heaven if you do, hell if you don't. What's going to happen if you don't buy this product? That's <laughs> the going to fall out. Yeah, right. Basically, do you kind of do you get that straight away? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow, and that's powerful so, in marketing, right? Absolutely. So it's one of the hardest hardest bits of marketing for business owners to kind of get to because, hey, I'm an accountant. I'll sort your numbers out. Like people are just selling accountancy, but what's what's the hell if you don't? So if you if you don't have an accountant, what's going to happen to you? Well, you'll get fined. Yes. If you don't do your company's house return, you'll get a letter through the post saying it's a hundred pound fine. Uh, potentially, you'll start paying interest on the tax that you haven't paid, and it goes on like that. Right. So that's where we start. So that's the value proposition of an accountant, and that's why people need an accountant. They might want an accountant, but actually, why they need it is to make sure that just all of that stuff is taken care of by somebody else. Awesome. Okay. So um, this is this is a good one. I, so there's someone in the group who's joining the accelerator next year, and uh, they're the lettings industry. What could be the value proposition for that? Could it be, I don't know, you're going to get crappy tenants in your house and, and so forth. Would that be kind of the thing you'd be yeah. looking for with that? that that's, that's the hell if, you, hell if you don't do it. Um, yeah, you could end up with really terrible tenants. And we've got a cast iron um, process. It's a 10-step a interview process um, that we go through with every single one of the tenants we place in your house um, so to guarantee that we get high-quality tenants. How does that That's work? amazing. Yeah, that's, no, that's really, really good. And I've got, what about landscaping, Rob? So there's someone who's joining the accelerators in the landscaping industry. How could that, could you say um, you're going to get a rubbish lawn? There's going to be litter all everywhere. Is that the kind of thing you'd say? 
Yeah, so do you have kids? Do I? Yeah, no, no, I'm just no. playing along with this. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, I have kids. So, so you've got kids. Okay, so is it a new house, old house? What's the... It's a, it's a pretty, pretty old house. Okay, and um, uh, just describe the garden at the moment to me. It's, it's quite big. Um, it's, uh, it's just, just turfed on. It keeps growing quite high. Um, there's quite a lot of leaves on it. Cool. Got pets? Yes, a sausage dog. A sausage dog, gosh. Okay, yeah. so do you spend much time in the garden? I'd want to spend more time with it, um, okay. but it's just too long and the dog keeps weeing everywhere and killing the grass. Okay, fab. And I'm guessing you're a bit time, you're busy professionals, so you don't have time to mow your own grass and, you know, that sort of thing. So dog really doesn't get walked that much, et cetera, et cetera. So first and foremost, I'd maybe consider getting a dog walker. Um, I can introduce <laughs> you to one if you want. Second of all, um, uh, what we can do is we can actually landscape your garden so that um, it's lower maintenance. So that if you wanted to, you could have, um, we could either take the grass out altogether. So you mm -hmm. can now get sort of fake AstroTurf type grass, which will, you know, all season round, won't have to mow it. That's absolutely fine. Or as part of our package, we can come in and mow the lawn for you and make it looks, make sure it looks absolutely pristine all the time um, to, to save you the time. Um, also, you can create some nice areas for your, your sausage dog to go and do his business um that's away from the children so we can create a separate section away from the children and i tell you what we'll do because you're a busy working professional when i produce the design for your garden um we'll put a space in there that's just solely reserved for you and your wife we'll call it the adult zone um you can choose to put what in there whatever you like whether it's a hot tub or whatever it is but we'll make sure that it's um a really tranquil place a retreat for you to go uh, on a friday evening when kids have gone to bed and it's a nice sunny evening um, you and your wife can, can just go and chill out in your your tranquility zone for a couple of hours with a glass of wine. How does that sound? That sounds phenomenal. Yes. Sounds great. Awesome. And that's okay, what so we can do for our landscaping process. Uh, amazing. So actually, you're actually, you, you know, you're working to the sale and you find that information, little snippets, and then you're adding that to actually what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So in terms of how that fits in with the product architecture side of things, so mm -hmm. now, for example, so I've kind of overcome, I know what you, what you want now, basically, or what yeah. you need. Um, but the first, when we actually then start mapping out the step-by-step -step process here, so you're, we're already at step like two, we're already at the consultation stage, basically, but mm -hmm. there are a number of steps that happen through this process. So it might be that, um, first of all, you've gone to my website, you're looking for a landscape architect, Maybe then you look at some testimonials, case studies, reviews, and things like that. That all form, mm -hmm. forms part of that product architecture. Then finally, you send me an inquiry. I might then send, send out an assessment form back. So some of those questions I've just asked you, I'll say, well, how big is your house? What's your postcode? I could look at it on Google Street View. Mm -hmm. um, do you have kids? Are you a busy working professional? What's your, you know, all of those sorts of things. Yeah. So actually, I can come pre-armed with a load of useful ideas at the consultation stage, which we're at now. And then I'll say to you, okay, next stage in my process. So if you're happy with this, um, I've got a, um, a bronze, silver, and a gold package. Okay. So mm -hmm. bronze is uh, basic. We'll come in, blitz your garden, tidy everything up, meet some of those requirements, make sure your dog's happy, make sure that you've got the, the beginnings of your zone. Mm -hmm. the, the silver package is um, <clears throat> we will go to town with your tranquility zone. <laughs> Right. And the platinum package is we will do everything to make this a wow garden that um, if that you would likely see on grand designs. Wow, okay. okay. So bronze, silver, gold. Yeah. Based on what you've told me, the package I would recommend for you is the silver package. Mm. Okay. We can we can we can put the platinum package in in 2018. That's fine. But for now, I think we'll start you off with the silver package. And the reasons for that are X, Y, and Z. Excellent. That's so, amazing. Now, once we put that garden in place for you, mm -hmm. um, you're then going to want to make sure it's just, you know, um, kept up to date and clean and, you know, lawns mown, gravels raked, pick up the leaves. Uh, we can even clear up the dog's mess if you want us to. <laughs> yeah. And that will be £200 per month. How does that sound? So, again, that's awesome. you're moving people, you're educating people about each one of the steps in your process all the way through. No, that's really good. And in regards to these phenomenal books, by the way, I've got your books here and uh, this one. Awesome. You can see it. And uh, so the story in this one uh, with regards to the pro golfer is uh, yeah. really, really cool. Can you just share 
a quick brief over that story for the for the group because I think it's really good. Yeah, sure. So um, the Golf Pro is actually one of my sort of earliest um, uh, consultations which I ran. So um, again, it's, it covers a lot of the ground we've already covered. So I'll try and keep it very brief, just so I'm not um, yeah. giving your, your your team some fresh fresh yeah. um, material. So that basically, the Golf Pro had two major problems that he was facing with this business. So effectively, he was selling golf lessons. So it wasn't a very complex business. But um, he had two main problems. The first one was that clients weren't turning up to every lesson. So if it rained on a Saturday morning, for example, um, six out of his eight lessons would just cancel. The mm. second problem linked to that was um, he was collecting money at the end of the lesson. <laughs> so if the clients didn't show, he wasn't getting paid. Um, and actually, he was also renting space from the, the owner of the golf course, uh, the driving range, at, at a cost of £5 an hour. So it was actually ultimately like costing him money mm. if six clients didn't show. I mean, that was rare. It was rare that six clients didn't show up, but it did happen. So in order to overcome that, I started asking some of those questions about what it was that he was actually selling and how we did it. So he was like, well, I'm just selling golf lessons. I thought, so, so how do you sell them? What questions do you ask? And he said, well, what, what clubs do you play with? How regularly do you practice? Um, uh, you know, how long have you been playing for? And those sorts of things. <clears throat> And I said, that's not specific enough. There's kind of no outcome. Mm. Like, I can go anywhere and swing a golf club and watch a few YouTube videos and get maybe get a bit better. Yeah. But I think you need something a bit more um, cast iron than that. So what it, one of the stories he told me was that um, a client had come to him because he was about to play um, in a tournament with his business. And he'd been um, uh, grouped in a foursome with his boss, his MD of the company. And he just wanted to look bloody good on the first tee. So, um, so I was like, cool, okay, well, there's, that's a value proposition. That's like, yeah. people want to look good. They want to play better. But what elements of the game do we want to play? So we designed five products, drive further, drive more accurately, uh, chipping around the green, lower your putting average, lower your handicap. Five, five clearly defined products. Mm -hmm. We worked out he could deliver any one of those five products in eight weeks, provided the client turned up to all, less, all eight lessons and they practiced in between lessons. And what we introduced was this, um, uh, just a very simple one page like sign up form. So they selected their products, they, the terms and conditions were show up to all eight lessons and uh, our practice in between and sign and date it. And he's like, cool, that sounds, and that sounds good. But how can I make more money? And I said, well, now we've productized it, we've wrapped it up, we've got these parameters, clearly to find outcome. We're going to charge £595 for that. And he's like, what? No, I can't possibly charge that much. <laughs> Oh, all the other golf pros will laugh at me. That's like four times the price. And I said, look, just, I've designed this thing for you. You know, I know this works because I've done it. My clients have done it. So print out 10, stick it on your desk. And the next 10 people that walk into the pro shop, just sell them. And the guy sold three in the first week. Wow, it's phenomenal. He's, he, since he's actually had guys come back and book, like, you know, so they'll buy the drive 30 yards further and then they'll come back and book the, the lower your handicap course. So he's now got repeat business on an ongoing basis. The comeback, right? Because they, they've found that they've got that skill now. They want, they want more skills. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And what, and just for the, for the, for the viewers is what actually was the result of, um, I think, what is, it, is his name David in the story? Uh, Russell. D Russell. David's the coach in the story. Right. Okay. That's me, really. That's me. <laughs> yeah, it's you. <laughs> but, yeah. But, but yeah, right, Russ, Russ is the, um, Russ is the golf pro. Great. And with regards to Russell, um, what, what was the end result for him? How, how did his business take off? He, he was earning really crap income and then he just went through the roof. Yeah. I mean, basically, so it, the, the immediate impact was, um, he started working more regular hours. So some weeks he'd be working six, seven days a week and uh, ridiculous things like, and that as daft as it sounds, if six clients didn't show up, okay, well, we can live with that. But if, the two clients who do show up are at seven o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the evening. Mm. He had like an entire day kind of wasted really where, you know, and yes, he'd fill it with having to sort of potter around doing, you know, a bit of marketing or cleaning up the gut in the pro shop. So the first thing was he, he was, he just knew that he had clients booked for eight weeks and he could take on 20 or 30 days at a time. Mm. Most of them would be happy because it's a lifestyle product. They'd be happy to do it during the week. Mm -hmm. So straight away, he got his weekends back. His hours reduced to nine to five. And he knew that he had steady recurring revenue and sales coming in throughout, basically throughout. Um, so that, that was kind of the, the major thing. The repeat business was interesting. Like I hadn't actually, I mean, it's obvious now, but I hadn't actually predicted it. So that's what I call yeah. a pixel, 
at moments. He's now also teaching other golf pros this process. The business side of it. Yeah. And awesome. he's actually charging, charging double now what effectively would be his hourly rate at the increased golf pro rate. He's charging wow. double that again for the clients he's coaching. Wow, that's phenomenal. I love that story. It's so, really, really good. But anyone in the group, I really highly recommend you read that book. Um, USP. So we've already touched on it very briefly, unique selling proposition. Why, yeah. why is it important for a business owner to find their USP in business? So, um, okay. So first of all, what, what is a USP? So the U unique selling proposition or um, I... I'm really conflicted here, actually, because I, I don't believe that, like, like I said, there's so many different businesses out there nowadays. And, you know, there'll be so many businesses doing exactly the same thing that you are. There are no new ideas. Nobody is going to come up with another Facebook. Yeah. Like, yeah, for yeah. Example. yeah. So why do we have to go around saying, you know, our, our quality is second to none? And our, like these are the sorts of very vanilla stuff that keeps on cropping up when you ask somebody for a USP. We're yeah. friendly. We're fun. We're better quality we would do it quicker than anybody else yeah those aren't usps in my mind because who's going to show up and say i'm going to do it worse than everybody yeah yeah, I'm yeah, do it yeah slower than everybody we're, we're not gonna have fun doing it in our mm. business so nobody's gonna say those sorts of things so but but actually a really true usp is everybody else is doing this like we're kind of doing the same thing we're just doing it 10 times better and the usp there is like the confidence if you've got this step-by-step -step process if it's less frustrating for your customer, less frustrating for you, if it genuinely does happen quicker, because people say we do it quicker and they don't. Yeah, so yeah. if you gen gen genuinely do have it productized and you can lead people through a seven step process, that's your USP. It's the process of delivery. Right. And, the outcome. and I also think that if you come up with a really neat product idea, you should back it. And what I mean by that is, if you wouldn't be confident offering that product to somebody with a money back guarantee, then you don't really believe in that product enough. Okay. So most people who haven't gone through the process of turning a service into a product, so productizing whatever it is they do, um, sit in the camp of, well, I've never offered a money back guarantee. Because if they're offering a custom product to like, different businesses so every product is different they don't know whether it's going to work or not it's a bit trial and error yeah whereas if you show up cons regularly and often with the same consistent message and same consistent process you can you know what the the outcome is going to be i used to in the one day branding work workshop just to just to kind of illustrate this mm. um and call this a usp if you like but i knew that when i sat with a client for seven seven hours in a one day branding workshop that at some point there would be a, an energy dip i didn't know okay. when it was going to be everybody in the room would have this energy dip and we would all feel low for a period of time, normally quite a short period of time, luckily. Occasionally yeah. it would last a bit longer. Yeah. But because I knew it was going to happen and it happened in every single one of the workshops, 40, 50 workshops that I've done, um, I knew how to pull the client out of it. Awesome. So that's the yeah. USP you found. Yeah. I could tell people, you're going to have a, we're going to have a lull at some point. When it happened, I'd say, there it is. And then I'd say, <laughs> cool, this is what we're going to do to get ourselves out of it and move forward awesome. because it created processes mind gets frazzled anyway <laughs> <laughs> great great stuff and the, why is it important to have a, a brochure when it comes to uh offering your products why is that really important because um so first and foremost um it it can act as a an ambassador for your business okay so call what do you mean by that soldier. So okay. call, it, maybe it's like a foot soldier. So you can have all, if you've got a thousand brochures, they're like a thousand foot soldiers that could be out there working as, as an ambassador for your business, telling mm -hmm. people about your products, your, your you know, showing people what your brand is. Um, also, it's, you don't just want to get somebody into a consultation and sell, 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 because mm -hmm. it's going to push pe people away. Um, yeah. they, they're going to see that it's this really hard sell. So, um, a brochure is a nice way when you get to the end of the consultation, they say, oh, I've just got to go in and think about it. Maybe they've got to chat about it with their wife. Maybe mm -hmm. they've got a, it's an expensive, like high ticket price item and they've just got a budget for it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay. But hey, why don't you take my brochure so that you've got something to remind you of me mm -hmm. when you're mm -hmm. going away and thinking about it. Awesome. Um, Great stuff. But it's, it's a really just a powerful thing. It's a, it's a foot soldier. It's just, like I said, an ambassador of your business when you're not there. Awesome. And 
how what kind of things should someone consider when packaging their products okay so first and foremost it's got to be about the outcome so I, I see too many business owners um, start up, I've got this great idea, it, like this thing that I've come up with. And like what might seem like a really great idea to me, Alex, might not be a fantastic idea to you. Luckily, yeah. you dig my, my crazy tooth toothbrushing tool that's going to help yeah, you. Yeah, business. exactly. Okay. Love it. Where is that, it? That's cool. But, you know, sometimes, um, you know, so I think you've got to have, okay, come up with a good idea, but really think about who's going to buy it and what the outcome is going to be for them. And I, I think it, if, if, you, if you're not in the game with a service-based business of changing people's lives, again, like that kind of should be an outcome, even mm. if it's only a little bit, mm. like the, our game is to change people's lives. Yeah. Um, think about like how, I know this sounds a bit woo-woo, you know, saying stuff like this, but mm. what's the outcome? How can you change people? How's your idea, your product, your service going to change people's lives? And then you can start to kind of reverse engineer it. Okay, well, what's got to go into this product now? What features have, have I got to add into this product that are going to deliver that outcome? Okay. Actually, you would come up with a very different set of features to oh, I've got a great idea and I'm going to take this idea and push it out in the marketplace. Uh, interesting. So you actually work backwards. So you've got this idea, you think of this amazing idea, but then you think, okay, the result that my customers are going to get, what kind of things do I need to add into this product or this this kind of concept to make sure they get that result yeah absolutely amazing and if you can't get there if you can't get there you've got yeah. to rethink that idea so if you can't build in enough value or when you've kind of gone through that process we've got the outcome we've got our feature set now what we're going to do because again a lot of people go through this like analysis paralysis thing where they they spend years come like perfecting this idea for a business and never yeah. take it to market and, and it frustrates the hell i like, seriously frustrates me too me too so so i'm kind of like well look you can spend 20 quid on a ticket for a networking event now you've got this product this outcome and this feature set go to a networking event and pitch it to a few people what's the worst that, that that's going to happen they're going to look at you a bit like you know, <laughs> yeah. or they might go god that's that's brilliant like let's go yeah. sit down for coffee i want to find out more about this thing and, th and then it's like it moves on to the next step. So kind of, so we've got the outcome, we've got the feature set, and now what we've done is just validated that idea for 20 Awesome. Quid. Great stuff. So for those who are listening and they think um, they're just starting out in business and they're a bit worried about actually putting their idea out there, what you're saying is that the quicker you get it out to the market, the quicker you can get that feedback, and then the quicker you can redefine it and uh, make it better than what it already is. Yeah. So if effectively, that, that 60 second pitch is like the thing which I'm saying, like, get that right. I mean, like I said, you wouldn't you wouldn't push. I mean, imagine if Tesla did release the Model 3 ahead of its time and it, it did only have three wheels and the battery wasn't Duracell. It was something else, you know, and it's yeah, a bit yeah. a bit naff. Like mm -hmm. it would be pretty, pretty bad for publicity. So um, it doesn't have to be perfect, but you've got to have you have got to have something of substance. But but in this instance, like done is better than perfect. So it could be that yeah, perfect could take 12 months, but imagine if you could get 80% of the way there within month one and take that mm. idea to market. Strip out the stuff that doesn't quite work. Don't show people the fact it hasn't got a Duracell battery and mm -hmm. only so, show one side of the car. Show it so it's, they can only see two wheels, not the mm -hmm. fact that on the other side there's only one. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> But take something of substance to the market and then test it because um, otherwise it can be damaging to the reputation. But pick the earliest possible moment to do that. Awesome. Great stuff. So the quicker you take action, the better. Yeah. Great. Basically. So with regards to um, so let's, let's go back to landscaping because it's a very seasonal business. Um, yeah. How can someone make sure that their business in that industry is still profitable because it's got barren spells. So how can someone ensure they are still profitable in December or November, etc.? Okay. So um, I'll, I'll use a slightly different example if that's okay. okay. So yeah, I yeah. actually did some work with a, uh, a window dresser. And so her problem is it's very seasonal. So, I mean, when I say window dresser, somebody who goes and designs um, wonderful shop window displays. So, okay. She charges £30 now. The typical, the average window takes about three hours to dress. So each window is, you know, to her worth about 90 quid. But um, 
the problem she was having similar was that she would be busy around um, Christmas, Easter, you know, Black Friday now. Um, yeah. And various other seasonal events that happen throughout the year. And for her, there was like between, I think there was eight, eight or 12 regular sort of seasonal things where she would have spikes in traffic. Mm -hmm. But the problem is in the downtime, she was constantly outside. And then in, in the se when the season kicked in, she was just flat out dressing windows and there seemed to be not very much respite. So actually what we did with her was that um, I, I said, well, how about you go to a, um, a shop that, you know, if you've got clients who come back time and time again, offer them a package of like 50 pound a month mm. and they get four windows dressed for that. So if you do the maths, you've just moved it from 90 yeah. times by four to, yeah. which is 360 pounds to 600 pounds a year. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. She gets the, the, the steady recurring revenue, 50 pound a month in, and she gives them a menu of seasonal events that they can select their four windows to be dressed. Amazing. And she would, she would, so God, she wouldn't need many customers either with that model. No, no. That's phenomenal. And that little ch change. Yeah. And it becomes predictable as well. So there's other, other bonuses. So the pixie dust moments for her were, she wasn't having to go back to shops like four times, six, seven, eight times a year and sell against them they yeah. were just bought into it even annually people would just keep on renewing um which was fantastic if she if she did reach a point whereby all of a sudden her capacity to dress enough windows at christmas was just reached she could pull mm. in another member of staff to train them up and help them and have wow. have a temp in for a month or two to dress the windows in the lead up to christmas and up to easter in various times and then release them again so in the quiet times she could just take all the cash <laughs> that's amazing that's yeah. really cool awesome and, it, and you could you could take a similar sort of approach to the the landscape gardener i suppose you know yeah ha how about so um maybe maybe yeah the busy period is going to be between spring sort of you know february march time through to i don't know our, our garden is still coming sort of you know we're in november so there may only be three months worth of downtime where actually you could maybe be educating them hey mm. have you thought about getting a greenhouse and I'll come and show you how to grow your own tomatoes. Okay, okay. So a so, bit of a different product. Yeah, we're, we're not gardening because the grass isn't growing. You know, we've trimmed everything back. That's not going to come up till February, March, April time. So why don't I show you, give you a few tips and we'll spend a bit of time getting to know one another. Grow some tomatoes. Everybody's happy. Awesome. Awesome. Great stuff. And what are some of the common mistakes you see when it comes to designing products or actually just you know, it could be designing products or building the products or putting the products out there to market. What's the common mistakes you see? Uh, so I think one of them I touched upon earlier on. So that that is taking a product to market that there is just no demand for. I think it's a great idea, but there's only one of, there's only one of me and this product's only ever going to satisfy one person. Yeah. Uh, second common mistake is is just trying to go for perfection and never launching the damn thing. Mm. Um, too many business owners doing that. And that actually is... A, as a coach, it's my job to spot when that's happening and challenge it and work yeah. out what it is that's stopping them from launching it. And typically that sits in there. This is where we get into the mindset sort of side of things now. But typically yeah. that's in, there, there is such a thing as failure to launch. So, and it's because of fear of failure, basically. Yeah. Fear, fear of people just not wanting the product. Yeah. Um, fear of, um, some people have a fear of success, believe it or not. They do, yeah. That's very true. Very you true. Know, what if this thing really takes off? How am I going to handle all the inquiries that are coming in? You know, yeah, that's yeah. A, that, and that could be a real problem, but equally or, it's a nice problem to have. Yeah, who knows? It is definitely, and it's some in internal belief of actually they don't deserve it. They don't deserve success. That's another one yeah. I've uh, come across. And the the third major thing is living in struggle. So what I what I mean by that is our accountant who's maybe oversold and taking on clients that on the wrong sort of packages or whatever or maybe he's he's strung out because it gets to january and he, everybody comes to him and he has tons of work and it's all it's all late and disorganized so and yet he does that year in year out <laughs> and mm. he accepts that that's just the way that accountancy happens so um you know ha again how we go about overcoming that is through the productization process but it's almost a bit like an alcoholic you've got to admit you've got a drinking problem before you go to A and A, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, you know, and um, A, A and A, A A, A, -A. Um, and 
it, it's that side of it. A business owner has to admit they've got a problem and that they, they've got no time and they're not earning to their potential and that it's having an impact on their family and things like that. You yeah. just got to have your eyes wide open in business and yeah. spot these things and be really self-aware. Yeah. Awesome. And with regards to a service industry, how yeah. can someone build, so uh, uh, consult, uh, what's it called? Uh, coaching. Let's use coaching, for example. Yeah. Or um, how can someone build a product in a service-based industry? What type of things can they do to actually just package it and productize it? So, uh, so I, work, I take coaching because it's something I know very well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, so coaching, for example, you can be um, sort of lulled into a, um, a time for money trap. Yeah. So, and may, maybe your limiting beliefs um, mean that you don't get above, you don't get the confidence to charge any more than £50 an hour. Okay. You've only got 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. realistically, that you can be coaching people. So even yeah. if you were doing 40 times 50, it's two grand a month. Okay. Well, eight, sorry, two grand a week, but eight grand a month. That's okay. Yeah. Now I know I would get burnt out very quickly if I was doing 40 coaching sessions. I mean, Me I do too. two a day and that's it, Max. Yeah. My energy's up and down. So immediately our capacity's halved. Now we're at 4K a month. Ah, no. Do you know what? Actually, I've got to do some marketing, some accounting, some sales. Mm -hmm. So now, actually, I can only do about 10 sessions a week at £50 an hour. Now my earnings capacity is at two grand. Mm -hmm. Can you see what's, what's going on? Yeah. So yeah. How we might change that is, so rather than me charging time for money that you come and sit on my couch in the coaching sessions, um, we're going to decide on what the goal is through working together. So if I double your turnover, how much is that worth to you? A lot. Wait, it's go I'm going to, yeah, it's going to be phenomenal. Yeah. So, so now all of a sudden, if, if we're talking about doubling turnover from, say, 20 to 40K a year, mm -hmm. the, that's what I call the uplift is 20K. Yeah. So how about you give me 10% of that? So you pay yeah. me two grand, we'll work together for six months, and we'll set the ball rolling so you can have double the revenue you've currently got. No brainer. Yeah. So now there's no, there's no time for money. I've just got to do everything that I can in order to make sure that you do double your turnover and I get my two grand. If I give you a, a go, and I'm not suggesting that this is what happens in coaching. Yeah. It, don't get me wrong. It has happened. You can create quick wins. That happens maybe with about 10 to 20% of clients, but most of them you've got to work with on a sustained basis because you're fixing this Yeah. as well as yeah. a number of other problems in the business. Yeah. But if I fix, if I double your turnover and I give you one piece of information in 15 minutes that enables you to double your turnover, two grand, 15 minutes work. I think that's fair if you then get 40 grand over the next year. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Some people go, guy, grand an hour. That's a bit ridiculous. I mean, I'm not, this is like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Two grand an hour, that's ridiculous. Um, but, but provided we agree it and you write yeah. a check for two grand and I, and I deliver on it. Great. Everyone's a winner. Also, you can you talked about product ecosystem. So yeah, now now we can start to. So there's obviously some knowledge IP in there that I'm delivering to you in order to help you double your turnover. Mm -hmm. Could I create other products to deliver that IP? I e books, e learning programs, like um, events, boot camps, all of those sorts of things. Yeah, so I can yeah. help multiple people who maybe can't afford two grand right now because maybe they've got debt and they just, yeah. they, they can't, they just don't want to take any more out and they can't afford two grand. Yeah. Okay. Well, what could I do? Well, I'm, maybe if I do a group workshop, the accelerator program is a, is a mm -hmm. good example of something like that. But, yeah. um, but for, for small businesses, so that rather than you pay me two, maybe we'll split it between 10 people and I'll give you a day workshop and it's a bit more affordable. So there's lots of different ways of leveraging your time and creating different products to deliver that IP. There's, you know, mm. Yeah, that's awesome. And a lot of people get, get blindsided by business. So, you know, for me, I'm in business because I love the freedom it gives me. Yeah. Um, and it's very important. So I mean, that's why I'm asking those kind of questions to actually regain back that time and productize uh, the service you actually are offering if you're in a service-based um, industry. Definitely. So, so always, like I said, start with the outcome. What's the outcome you're going to deliver? And how, mm. how much are people willing to spend on it? You know, mm. and can you, can you guarantee that? Um, and, and finally, like how, how else can you, what other, what other formats can you deliver that IP in? 
No, amazing, amazing stuff. And what's one bit of advice you can give to someone in the group when they when they rewatch this is that they've got this idea because I, I firmly believe that we've all got ideas. It's just actually implementing them um, that they can go out and actually implement something that's going to move them forward in the sense of productizing their idea. So I clearly, clearly buy take your shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But buy this. <laughs> totally, totally unsubtle plug there. But <laughs> that does explain the productization process for a start. Yeah. You can't, you can't do it on your own though. So um, I, I think that um, business is really quite hard mm -hmm. um, in, in many respects. And actually, mm -hmm. regardless of whether you take on a coach or do accelerator programs or anything like that, find a buddy share your uh, like a business buddy share your ideas with them go and have coffee once a week like start start helping each other with your ideas because you'll hit upon stuff that you probably wouldn't have discovered or worked out on your own yeah um and and also just to um like jfdi night plus just do it because um so, like life is too short basically <laughs> yeah you know, you've got this burning desire like there's no such thing as failure in my opinion. You there is never fail at something because life will still carry on regardless. Mm -hmm. Fa failure doesn't exist because you, you, what you will have done is validated your idea regardless of whether it worked or not. Yeah. And it's got you one step closer to that actual success. Like, Absolutely. I mean, the amount of times and, and people think as, as well, when they look across failure, sorry to interrupt, they think of this, um, oh, the business failed when that's not the case. There's little failures like, Oh, that lead magnet didn't work. That marketing yeah. piece didn't work. They're little failures. It's not actually your business hasn't failed. It's just, I don't know, I didn't get that investment or that guy said no. Little failures. Yeah. And actually you're getting closer to actually saying that yes, because you know what doesn't work now. So they can yeah. say, right, okay, we're going to try this way. As a, as a business, so I'm going to tell you a little story, actually, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, of um, course. So, so I, I'm a keen cyclist and um, wrote on road bikes and mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a whole like um, club and like really, like, again, it's a nerdy geeky thing. But, <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I love going down hills. I go down hills at about 50 miles an hour on a push bike. Wow. Okay. But going up hills, always struggle. So the first, when I first started going out cycling, my brother had built me this like, it, I was obviously very grateful, but he built me this bike. It was like a steel frame, heavy as anything. Had a triple speed on it, and going up hills was just painful. So I used to like granny gear it up at three and a half miles an hour. And the first time I remember, I, I I stopped twice up this like one hill that's the biggest challenge locally to us. And and I might as well it would have been quicker just to get off the thing and bloody walk up the hill. <laughs> yeah. And this guy this guy came flying past me, and I shouted up to him, "Oh God, you're making that look easy." And he, I couldn't, he was so far in the distance by this point, I couldn't hear what he shouted back, but lovely guy. And this is, this is the whole like um, community around cycling. He stopped at the top to have a chat. And he said, one of the things he said to me that stuck with me ever since, so this was even before I started coaching was, um, it, it never gets any easier, you just go faster. And it's exactly the that. same with business. Bus business, I don't feel it ever gets any easier. It just goes faster. And you mm. get better at it and you get fitter at business and it becomes a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. completely agree. So you actually get stronger, right? That's, that's what you're saying. Actually, these problems you occur when you start out, if they happen again in the future, well, actually, you know how to deal with them. So you actually get yeah. tougher mentally and you know what to do. Yeah, absolutely. But business, but it's like the gambling adverts, when the fun stops, stop. <laughs> when, yeah, yeah. when business, when business the enjoyment of business stops that's the bit that people perceive as being a hard thing about business mm. you know and the struggle that i mentioned earlier on so um it, if you if you just got to keep on keep on plugging away you've got to have a really strong desire those little obstacles you talked about actually in the moment are like massive mm. you've actually got to have a really strong will to overcome them yeah i'm actually Again, looking I was going to say, if you're in the game of changing lives with your product or service, whatever it is you're selling, that's easy. You yeah, know, I'm going to go, it's easy to overcome those challenges. Yeah. And actually looking back, you know, when those problems actually occur, you actually think that's why I went through that problem, because this problem presents itself now in the present. And yeah. I, I know how to deal with it. Yeah. 100%. That's awesome. And Absolutely. what do you love about business, Rob? What, what's one thing that you really are thankful for being in business? Um. <sighs> God, that's a really deep question. Um, <laughs> I get I get an enormous satisfaction whenever my clients share their wins with me, mm. and and like 
I've got one client who is, um, you know, when I first started working with them, turning over a thousand pound a month as an agency, husband and wife team. In this day and age, it's not a lot enough money to live on. No, it's like not. They, they had ambitions. I talked about their goals. They wanted to buy a house. They were having a second baby. And, you know, she didn't want to go back to work because she works in the public sector and it's very stressful. Hey, that's, you know, like most of the guys who we're going to be working with, hopefully. Yeah. And, um, you know, within eight months, I got them to regularly, so the direct debit, 3K a month dropping into their bank account. Now, that to them is a life-changing sum of money. When you've got a client sat in front of you, where eight months earlier they're in that horrible, painful, stressful bit of mm. their life, move into a position of, we're stuck, you know, we've got a savings fund now for our mortgage. Um, you know, we've, we've had our second baby, and actually, we, we don't need to ask the question, does, does my wife have to go back to work? Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Changing lives. That's what it's all I love about. that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Rob. I really appreciate it. I think we're about Pleasure. the hour mark. Um, for those who are going to meet Rob next year, hopefully we're having a, uh, a one-day event in Feb. So the response on Facebook's been really good. Um, but people can meet you there who attend. And I really recommend that they go and grab uh, this phenomenal book and this book, of course. So <laughs> yep. there you go. Thank you so much for your time, Rob. Um, if anyone's got any questions, pop it in the comments section below and uh, myself and Rob will try and get back to you. Um, and yeah, I'll catch you later. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Take care, Rob. Bye-bye. Cheerio. Take care. Bye-bye.